Hello and welcome to the Paper Knives Poetry Interview Podcast. Today I'm joined by Elizabeth M. Castillo, a British Mauritian poet, writer, indie press promoter, and two-time Pushcart nominee who lives in Paris with her family and two cats, where she writes a variety of things in a variety of languages under a variety of pen names. And at the time of this recording is releasing uh, her poetry book, Not Quite an Ocean. I'm very, very grateful after all of the technical difficulties uh, and time zone scheduling errors on my part to welcome Elizabeth M. Castillo. Elizabeth, I'm wondering if, if we could just kick this, uh, this conversation off with a reading of a poem. Uh, and yes. as, we, as we talked about beforehand, I've got a few requests, um, my first of which is from the, the first of four sections in the book, Pacific, the poem To mm -hmm. Be a Woman. <clears throat> so thank you for having me, Nick. I would love to read that poem for you. It's one of the earlier poems, um, that early in terms of when it was written, um, that became sort of one of the cornerstones of this collection. I'm just pulling it up here on my computer because I don't, as of yet, know all of my poems by heart, unfortunately. So here we go. To be woman. <clears throat> to be woman is to be pieces is to be needed, is to be blamed, deserving at all times. To be woman is not to be anything. To be woman is to be everything. All things bound together. And if you can manage it, just that little bit more. To be woman is to be pitted, teeth bared, taut muscle, sharp claws, brawling, raving, hungry backs against the wall. To be woman is body dysfunction. Is body misunderstood? Is body underfunded, uninsured? Mystery illness, ovarian taxation, reproductive discrimination, persecution, enshrined in law. To be woman is nurturing, provision, is scheming, obsession, is wanton, waiting, abandon, the forest in an acorn, an ocean, in a person. So that was my poem, To Be Woman. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things of many that I uh, really enjoy about this poem is the way that it wraps up sort of explicitly one of the major themes of the book. Uh, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about um, the, I guess, the, the implot, well, it's not even implied, but the metaphor uh, or the metaphorical connection between the woman or woman generally as ocean and how those two concepts sort of fused for you uh, over the course of your writing. Uh, it's an interesting thing because uh, they didn't fuse at all during the course of the writing. It was only after the fact that I looked at my poems and I was like, ah, woman poem, ocean poem, woman poem, ocean poem, poem where there's woman is an ocean, etc. So... Um, it was very natural, very organic, the way it came together. I, I'm afraid, um, to some extent, that using the ocean or the earth or the environment as a metaphor for womanhood or womanhood as a metaphor for what's happening during the climate crisis is a fairly obvious um, sort of you know, connection, a very ob obvious equation. But then again, what's wrong with things being obvious if they are obviously so? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So actually this poem started off <laughs> with the line, to be woman is to be pitted, because it was based on a personal experience, which I'm sure many women have experienced where um, someone's feeling insecure and because of the patriarchal society that we live in, uh, it's very easy to quickly you know, go for the jugular and, and criticize and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just came from that and a very tired feeling of how long are we going to do this? Why can't we just... If we have issues with each other, why can't they be on a human level rather than when it comes to this sort of, you know, being pitted against each other, comparison, etc. And then from sure. there, the rest came along. The body, the, um, the societal expectations, the ocean, the environment, etc., etc. Um, right. As I said, it, 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 it's probably a fairly obvious, um, you know, line of reasoning to understand that when we're talking about women and oppression and abuse and violation, 
it's very clear to be able to see that that correlation with the environment. And I think that's that's also just a, a human cultural thing. Earth has always been a mother. The goddess of the earth has always been a female mm. um, history. So I don't think it's anything new there, but it's definitely sort of something that, that came together very naturally for me. Sure, yeah. I think the correlation between womanhood or femininity, uh, the feminine principle, and sourcehood, uh, I mean that seems, as you said, like an obvious connection, and you know the the symbol of Mother Earth in all of the various different uh, forms of divinity that different cultures have have generated does seem, on the one hand, to be traditional and thus obvious. But I think that you handle that theme in some really interesting particularities. I mean, so for instance, when you talk about pitted and pittedness, on the one hand, there's the the opposition or oppositional cultural uh, yeah. outgrowth of something like what we might call toxic femininity in terms of like, right, like women criticizing one another or men criticizing women, uh, and, right? But but also I think the the notion of pitted like a pitted date, uh, right? The the notion that like the core has been taken out, right? That which generates life has been taken out. And to that point, I think it seems indicative of the culture that we live in, right? Because by choosing this uh, symbol of the ocean as an overarching metaphor, itself, uh, itself a, a, a synecdoche of na nature itself, I think that you bring up the kind of part-whole duality, right? Because there's a sense in which, like, the woman is the wave, which is a part of the ocean, right? And yet the ocean contains all things within it. And so... To that extent, right, like even the patriarchal impulse that pits human beings against one another, men against women, women against one another, is itself contained by the feminine principle, right? Like it can't exist without that source. And that is, that is in fact what I say later on in another poem called Who Will Hold the Ocean? Mm. It is the constant giving and even your, even your um, the, the structures that exist that are to the ocean's own detriment she holds them up because mm. she has no choice that is kind of the way I, I saw it and that can be taken you know down if we want to really zoom into it in my personal life to to women kind in general to women of color like myself in global south or to mothers to you know what i mean it can be taken to any real scale of, of of how how you want to look at it really mm -hmm. um but as I said, it was very interesting because it, it happened completely organically. At no point did I think, okay, I'm going to take the ocean and parallel. No, it just really happened after the fact. And that is what fed into the layout of the poems as well as they're divided into chapters of the ocean. I quite like chapters. All my poetry books have chapters um, with the four oceans. And and that's sort of what determined what went where, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And what, which number poetry book is this? How many have you done previously? This is the second. This is the second, okay. same, all of them. I have seven. Um, I do, but they're on submission. <laughs> sure. I have, I have probably two more that are finished and complete, and they are also strangely divided into chapters. I don't know if that's just a dyslexic, dyspraxic thing of mine that I need it to be sort of compartmentalized like that. Um, but, yeah, this is the second. My first cajoncito, which was multilingual, was also in the chapters of love, loss, and other madness. And what what drove you for this book in particular, uh, if if you're able to identify anything, to have it be uh, you know an English dominant or, or solely English written book? Um, it was this came about in a very unusual way in that it was I mean it wasn't commissioned, but I I had my two other collections that I was working on and adding poems to. And then the, the editor-in-chief of this publishing house, who I admire, who's published many poets that I absolutely adore, um, approached me and said, basically, I'd like to publish one of your books. And so I was like, oh, you know, you don't let an opportunity like that slide. Right. So, but my, my motherhood collection wasn't quite ready, and it wasn't quite, a, you know, wasn't quite ready to let that one go yet. And then my other collection is more experimental, which is not really their vibe. And so I thought, but I can't let an opportunity like this slide. So I basically put a whole bunch of the other homeless poems I had that didn't really have a theme or a, or a discipline kind of um, to them together. And uh, To Be Woman was one of them. The other one is my favorite poem that I've ever written, The Other Woman, that I can read mm -hmm. to you later, in fact. And as I put them together and began to add to them, then I saw that actually there are very clear themes of femininity, feminism, 
the woman's experience general, generally, not just feminism, but just the woman's experience, and then the environment, nature, and the ocean. So that's sort of how, how it came together. And by nature of that fact, the poems weren't multilingual. They just weren't. They, they were poems that didn't have another language in them. And yeah. he's an English, um, the, the editor who approached me, he's an English-based, he's based in the north of England, so his pamphlets and his chapbooks are, his pamphlets and his collections are all in English. Um, and then my, my multilingual writing is, in fact, very little of what I do is intentional. The multilingual writing is not intentional either. It just comes to me in that language or with mm. that line in that language. And so because none of these poems did, I think there's only one word in Spanish, well, I wasn't going to wasn't going to force it, you know. I thought about it, though, because I know that some of my readers do have come to me because they like the multi multilingual element. Mm. And I sort of felt, oh, but what if what if they're disappointed with this or what if they don't buy it, et cetera, et cetera. But then you have to be true to the... True sure. to the sure. sounds terribly pretentious, but you have to be true to the art, you know, true to whatever story you're telling. Um, you can't force it, otherwise it, 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 it just, it rings hollow, you know. Yeah, well, from the perspective of another writer, I would say it doesn't sound pretentious at all. It sounds authentic. <laughs> I think we can. I think as poets, we have a bit of a reputation, so I try to, as much as possible, dismantle that. Sure. <laughs> that we're not the abstract philosophical beings all the time. Right, uh, or at least that we can come down to. We can come down from our flighty. Uh, mingle with the ordinary folk, okay? <laughs> right. Sure. Well, I mean that's the function historically, right? Is that like the that the the one with the connection or the oracle right like brings uh, the divine de the divine word down to earth or materializes it. So I I mean there's certainly some elitism in that. You're comparing us to the prophet. I'm I'm sort of more comparing us to like the minstrel and the jester. That's more sort of. <laughs> oh, I think I think the function of the minstrel and the jester are very similar in that uh, right they they both speak to and amuse the power structures that are there as well as to uh, entertain and enliven the criticism that the, the hoi polloi might have of, of the power structure. Yeah. Uh, so you talked uh, a bit about how this book came together, and actually you talked kind of at length about how this book came, came together. I'm curious about how you got to this point and what your journey with writing has been. I mean, how did you get started? Um, how did you start working in the different genres that you do work in? or and have it those pen names, and how did you come to put together these two most recent poetry books that you've got? Well, um, it's all a bit unorthodox, I guess. I, I have no qualifications. I know that, in, especially in America, sort of having an MFA in art and whatever is a bit of a big thing. Um, not so much in the UK, which is more of where my affinities are. Um, and so I, I study modern languages. I'm a linguist. I'm a language teacher by trade. And I've always loved writing. When I was younger, I used to write, you know, very angsty, teenage sort of poems for myself. So that was always what writing was. It was never really much more than that. But at the same time, I always had lots of ideas for novels, for books, for kids' books especially. Um, and I never really did anything with them because it was just something that was in my mind. And then COVID hit, and I was very ill, and I was stuck in bed, and I reread all of my Jane Austens and all of my Elizabeth Gaskells and Nancy Trollops and all the Victorian literature. And I watched all of the adaptations again, and uh, because I was bedridden, I, it wasn't enough for me, so then I fell into the world of retellings and variations, etc. And um, as I was in that world, I thought, well, I can write this. I have ideas for a retelling of, uh, mm. namely, North and South Elizabeth Gaskell's book, which is one of my favorite books ever written, where you change the plot and where you change this and that, and it's a universe that exists and you just sort of do what you want with it. And, um, and I mean, our world is full of retellings. You know, Bridget Jones's diary is a retelling of Pride and Prejudice, you know, all sorts of things like that. So, so that's how I started writing, and I wrote my first full-length <clears throat> novel and published it online for free because I didn't really have the confidence to do anything else, and it was very well received. Um, and then from then, um, I, <laughs> I unhappied my way into poetry, having experienced a moment, as many people did during the pandemic, um, of illness, of lots of people passing away around me, and I think that just a lot had to come out and it came out in the form of poetry again, but this time as an adult, as someone who had written, as someone who was a lot better read, 
And I just started to write and write and write. And the more I wrote, the more I realized I didn't know about writing. So I attended workshops and I bought poetry craft books and I taught myself. And, and the wonderful thing is that there's so much online these days, you know, from websites from tutorials from Open University. So I just educated myself and worked and worked and worked at it. I'm still doing that. Uh, sent my work out to magazines to be published, learned how that worked, learned how to do social media, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a constant learning thing for me. And um, and basically, Cajontito came about when I had enough poems to make a collection with, and they all kind of were were done, and they needed to be put away. And that's what Cajontito means, little box or little drawer. They needed to be put away somewhere, and that's where my first collection came from. And I've just never looked back since, really. Um, and I think that that experience of having written that first full-length novel, and having had some, you know, having had my poetry well received. It gave me more than anything the confidence because now I've got about, you know, five or six children's books that are being edited that I need to send out for submission. I'm currently banging away at my second novel. I'm still working on my other poetry collections. Um, I think all I needed was just that push that, you know, just just do it, Lizzie. Come on now, <laughs> kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, And there's also that other phenomenon that I think that if I had studied creative writing, I don't think I would have appreciated it half as much as I do now when I learn something because mm -hmm. it's so precious. I think many people who learn or who study later in life feel that anyway. But um, when I go to a workshop and I learn a new experimental technique or I learn how to write a villanelle, I use the word term learn very loosely here because my goodness, how do you write those? Um, or, you know, whatever it is, I really, I savor the information and the skill and it's, it's, it's just so fascinating and fun and rewarding. Um, so yeah, that's that's what that what that's what's brought me pretty much up until this point in time. And I'm still I'm still learning and still going. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm a self-taught poet because I think that also there can be so much gatekeeping around. Uh, this person is that poetry fellow, and that person is qualified with this, and they were published by this, and they're part of this circle, and that's great for them, but most of us aren't. And so if I can say to people, actually, you can be self-taught, and you can just do it for the love of it, and you can actually you know, sell books and make a business out of the love of it, then, then I hope that that would encourage people you know, mm -hmm. in the same predicament or situation as myself. Wonderful. I mean, it's great to hear that you're not just thinking about it from the standpoint of your own writing and your own publishing of your own work, but that you're actually seeing the way that your engagement in that process can benefit the larger creative writing community. Well, it's uh, we need each other, don't we? I mean, where are we without our our village of creative writers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there as much as any audience of creative writing who isn't a creative writer might appreciate the work, I think, to the point of the earlier conversation we were having. It's, I, I find that there's something that other poets understand about the lived experience that I have as a poet that people, people who aren't writers in any way or who don't have that kind of relationship to language just don't get. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, let's be honest now, poetry is unfortunately seen as very niche. And I would say the biggest consumers of poetry are probably writers or literary people. Mm. Um, so they are also our target audience, if we're honest. Sure, certainly. Um, I'm kind of curious, as a language teacher and as a linguist, uh, how do you, what is your writing routine like? Like, how do you actually get your writing done? And how do you balance that with your career outside of writing? That, that is a good question. At the moment, I'm actually not teaching. I haven't taught all year because, unfortunately, I have long COVID, so that kind of sucks. But I am actually launching a business to start my own language school locally in the town that I live in here in France. Um, I'm a homeschooling mother as well, so that takes up most of my time. And uh, and I do some charity work, and I run a little translation business as well. Anyway, I've got lots of, lots of as they say in France, lots of pots on the hob, you know, lots of pots on the cooker. And um, how do I balance it? The word routine is not one that exists in my life, I must say. But that's the advantage of poetry, is that often poetry, at least for the conception of poetry, it can be done, can be snatched moments, because the line comes to you, or that idea, or that image, and it's quickly on the phone, or quickly on a notepad. And then I have, in order to take my writing um, seriously, I take myself seriously as a writer, I have also uh, carved out time where my children are away at a playgroup for a whole day, and so that's my writing day. And then for another sort of 
segment of time twice a week I have four hours which is my writing time and that is set in stone there's no appointments there's no visits there's no nothing um, and during that writing time I, I have ADHD so if I don't switch things up I will just you know color color co <laughs> color coordinate my color code my highlighters or <laughs> you know what I mean do absolutely irrelevant tasks to procrastinate because what even is that um, so I do need to clearly have my list and usually it goes something like in four hours I will have maybe an hour of submitting which I mean is a form of torture um, my work magazine um, and social media promotion talking to people booking appearances things like this um, programming scheduling my my social media posts etc etc maybe an hour of looking at what I have and what I can edit and what I can do with it and then two hours of writing whether it's my novel or my poetry or whatever it is. So that is roughly the closest that you will get to a semblance of routine in what I do. <laughs> but the rest is all very creative and artistic and very sort of... In fact, I, I joke about it. I think, I think in two different poems I mentioned that I write poetry in the bath because it's true. It's the only time when there's nobody talking to me and nobody touching me and no one's nose needs wiping and, you know what I mean, no one needs feeding. And it's the only time, so I take my phone into the bath, and I think at least, what, maybe a third of these poems in this collection were written, if not, or edited, if not written, in the bathtub. Well, that, I mean, that in itself is uh, quite poetic, given the, the Ooh, central like role that water plays in it. I mean, you take I know, it sort of comes full circle. Absolutely, I do like yeah, that, yes. The water cycle. <laughs> well, as a, as a fellow neurodivergent with an ADHD diagnosis, I, A, I feel very validated. Uh, and B, the, the description that you gave of how you break up your week actually gives me a lot of, uh, a lot of good ideas for how I can go about being uh, perhaps more productive than I currently am. So thank you for, for both of those. You know, you know what helps me actually particularly as someone who has ADHD is to, to schedule in time to do writing adjacent things. So mm. whether it's mocking up book covers, which is the writer's favorite form of procrastination, or making a mood board or writing a list, whatever it is, that time is scheduled. So I'm like, okay, Lizzie, you've got your time to do your, you know, procrastinating in a structured way. And then you write. And I, you're probably the same in that once you sat down, you've gotten 10 minutes in, it's coming. It's, you know, that's, but the, getting to those 10 minutes where you're sitting down and not being distracted is so difficult. So as long as I can kind of get to that point, then I should get some good writing done. And I write fairly quickly as well. So that's an advantage. And so once I'm done, I feel really good about myself. And then tomorrow, you know, we can do it all again. Um, do, you, do you mind if we turn our attention to a poem from the Atlantic oh, section, no, Waves? Waves, did you say? Yeah. Okay, of course. Now, this is actually a, <laughs> a funny story with Waves. It was meant to be in my first collection. And oh. I, I self-published my first collection, even though I, I did get two publishing offers, but they wanted me to change too much, and I didn't like their, their changes. So I ended up self-publishing because I wanted the whole experience myself. And it was only once the book was on, on pre-order that I realized that this poem was not in it. Um, so it was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but then obviously it sits very nicely in my, poem, in my poetry book about the ocean. So here we go. Waves. Have you ever stood inside the ocean? Toes curled. Shaky purchase on the seafloor. There is a lesson to be learned if you will stand and defy Poseidon inside his own court. Waves. They travel single file to hide their numbers. Waves. They suffer neither fool nor survivor. Waves. They just keep coming. The moon. She has no care for the divisions of your life. For these tiny boxes you amass and fill, compartments overflowing, still she stands, looming as her soldiers consider their onslaught. Waves, breaking neither themselves nor each other. Waves at every side, there is no path outside of them. Waves, exiling you back to the shore. How long have you been standing there? Hmm. One of the things that I love about this poem is the way that uh, the ending on the one hand suggests, right, there's there's the sort of uh, Emsonian, I'm not sure which of the seven types of ambiguity this is. I can't really remember oh, the model. I have no idea. I, I just told you. I don't have an MFA. Yeah. I have no idea. There's, there's a wonderful uh, way in which the, the closing line both mm -hmm. suggests or can suggest that the reader is standing on shore and not in the ocean and is sort of 
waiting to step in, and then on the other hand, because they've gone through the litany that you've just provided, they're, they've found or discovered that they've been standing in the ocean the entire time. Uh, yeah. So it's one of the things that I really enjoy about this piece, along with the way that I think it really emphasizes the aspect of the collection being, right, that the ocean is the waves, but it's also the totality of the ocean. Um, I'm wondering, given given that that metaphorical connection between um, femininity or womanhood and the ocean through the book in general but this piece in particular I'm I'm really curious about how you imagine in a best case scenario like men might take this poem what they might gain from this because it, it I think far too often in my experience the readers of womanist or feminist literature tend oh, to be women and no, you know we don't need to this stuff I mean, I'm not, I think it's probably, my, my assumption is that it's likely validating for the yeah, feminine experience, but I, I'm interested as, a, as someone who identifies as a man or who is assigned male at birth and kind of just follows mm -hmm. along with the way that I've been assigned. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what your hope as an author is for what my ilk might take out of this. <laughs> I love that question, and I love that you saw. I mean, and no one's ever at least said to me they've noticed the fact that at the beginning, have you stood inside the ocean, and then you're actually standing somewhere. Where are you standing? I love that you noticed that. Um, in fact, that came last. That last line did not exist, and then afterwards, when I read through it again, I was like, no, it's not finished. Where are they? I want that to be that element of almost like you've woken up from a daze, and oh, you know. Um, there was a, there's, an, there's a side to it where somewhere I, I imagine, because I imagined it very visually as a beach in Mauritius where I'm from, and that without realizing it, because you are under the onslaught of waves and currents, you don't realize that you have actually waded into the ocean. That was how I imagined it visually in my head. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for picking that up. And as for the members of, you know, people of your ilk, as you said, <laughs> Um, I actually put out a tweet a while ago, not about this collection, but I have another collection about motherhood and matricence and mental health and birth and all sorts of things. And uh, again, fairly, you know, loaded feminine associated themes. And I was just curious whether or not men, especially the men who follow me on social media, who are literary in some, some way, whether they would be interested in you know a collection like that I know many would buy it out of support for my work perhaps but whether it would be something like oh I really am looking forward to reading this mm -hmm. and um, and a lot of them were were very sweet and were very honest and they said look I don't think I would but because it's your writing I would or if there was a particular poem I liked but it wouldn't be something I'd come to naturally um, which I appreciated because it's exactly what I imagined would happen mm -hmm. um, so I, I would I would hope that this this collection would speak to anyone. I would imagine that the male reader might see more of the climate crisis than of the womanhood. I imagine that a, 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 a woman reader would probably identify, as you say, with the subtlety that maybe would go over a man's head, perhaps, right. which is fine, which is what poetry is for anyway. It's a different thing to every reader. But I would hope that at least maybe perhaps this poem is not, in my opinion, one of the more feminine ones, but in the poems where things are fairly explicit, that there would be a sort of a call to action of the humanity of it. Mm -hmm. it, it would somehow be represented in such a way of like, yes, this is a woman's struggle more than anything else, more than any other member of, you know, group of society. But somehow I have my responsibility in it. I guess I would hope that. Um, but then I don't really have too much of an opinion about that sort of thing because I do believe that poems, they transform depending on who's reading them. Mm. And I hope that they do. So, I mean, I love it. I have another poem called The Storm Tower that's in this. That's one of my longer poems. And it's written very specifically about a specific event and about the climate crisis. And I loved it because it was beta read by about 10 people, men and women. And... Um, and one non-binary person, if I remember correctly, and each person came back to me saying, oh, I love that this is about miscarriage, and I love that this is about a heartbreak, and I love that this is about writing a poem and struggling with writer's block. They all came back with a completely different take on it, and I love that, because that is the wonderful thing about poetry. You know, mm -hmm. it's like painting. It is whatever the reader needs it to be. 
and there's no other really written art art form which which is so flexible and versatile in that sense you know mm, indeed yeah uh, i mean poetry generally is very accommodating and what i've what i've read uh of the collection so far of your collection so far it, it these are particularly accommodating poems it i mean it does literally feel in reading these poems like you are slipping into or stepping into the ocean and sort of you know oh that's, oh, that's one thing i need to put that on a blurb that's exactly yeah. what i wanted that's wonderful the waves of the lines are washing over you or in the case of this of of waves the poem i think you end with a a repetition of questions that that sort of wash over the reader yeah. Um, I think on on both counts, right? Like, what is what is the relationship between the climate crisis and the state of the natural world that we live in, and what is the state of the of the human race, given the way that um, its patriarchy and misogyny have been internalized and sort of bedeviled women, in the same way that capitalist tendencies have bedeviled our our planet and its climate, right? <laughs> Yeah, so we're all we're all in it together, as you say, and 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 because you also identify some of the, um, you know, the competition between women or what I'd previously referred to as toxic femininity, I think, you know, you likewise are able to identify the complicity that each one of us has because we're all part of it, you know, like Absolutely. we are. Um, we want to. Yeah, right, <laughs> and that and that's the thing that I think, um, you know, hopefully it it spurs. It spurs the reader to at least contemplate what sorts of concrete actions they could take uh, on both yeah. of those fronts. How, given that you just talked about this last line and and that it hadn't been there initially, and then in reviewing the collection you realized it wasn't finished and you wound up adding that last line, how is it, if there is any kind of regularity for you, how is it that you know when a poem is done? Oh, I saw that question. I know that you asked that question. It's a, it's a terrible but a wonderful question because I, I don't know. It's like cooking, you know. I, I hate baking because baking is science. It's precise. If you get like, you know, I mean, half a gram wrong, then it all, I hate it. But I love cooking. I love, I guess, because I've got, you know, strong sort of South Asian roots and Mauritian, like cooking is a family thing. It's flavor. You throw in a bit of this, you throw in a bit of that, you see what happens. And my approach to poetry is the same. In the same way that I take that last taste of the sauce and I know it's perfect, or it needs a bit of lemon or a bit of a kick, it's the same thing with a poem, basically. And you read it and it's like, mm, not quite there. Or you read it and you're like, wow, that is a banger. I am the best poet in the world, you know? And until you get that feeling, it's not ready, basically. Sure. Um, and, and I think, for example, Waves was written quite a long time ago. There must also be, but you don't always have the luxury of that time, that feeling of... Um, you're so far removed from when you wrote it that it's almost like you're reading a piece of work from someone else and yeah. legitimately, objectively, it's a good poem. That's, that's I think, the, the, the sort of confirmation. But as I say, you don't always have that luxury of time. Um, but definitely with this one, it was the same thing. It was just, it was lacking a little bit of chili flakes on the top or whatever it was. It needed mm. to be well rounded out. I just needed that dash of that last yeah. line, that question. And it was perfect. Then it was delicious. Uh, I'm wondering if we could turn to the poem uh, after poem after my four-year-old's bedtime tantrum. Yes, this, yes. This is uh, among all of the the pieces that you have. I think that you do a wonderful job of expanding the conception of what poetry can be because of the way that you kind of vacillate in these pieces between the prose poem and the mm. standard verse poem. And this one in particular seems like a very interesting hybrid approach to that. So. Yes. I'd, and I look forward to hearing you read it. Okay, all right. So, poem after my four-year-old's bedtime tantrum. I just want to brush my teeth and cry in the dark. Just want to eat cheesy pasta, which is mostly cheese. I just want my early wake-ups to be hours before the alarm clock. Want my lactose intolerance not to show up on my skin. Just want to hear your voice rumble against my ear. One last time, just want to fold you back inside of me safe. Just want my house to fill my house with hanging plants. Just want to forgive, 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 as I am forgiven. Just want to rent a car and drive through a snowstorm. Want to never have to come back here again. I just want to fill my lungs with smoke and hope and ambition. Just want to let the gray grow out. Want to live in a shack by the ocean. Just want to hear your voice calling to me. 
once again. I just want to make my peace and not be your reason for therapy. I want to stop forgetting to drink my coffee. Just want to laugh and love and write and make love and lose sight of everything in between. I'm curious. Uh, if you, because our listeners will not have the benefit of seeing this on the page, so I'm going to try to briefly describe it. Um, arranged, for, you know, left and right justified. Um, as a paragraph. With, yeah, as a paragraph, I, I believe without any punctuation other than no flashes that mm -hmm. typically indicate line breaks. And what I heard in the reading was that they do indicate pauses for you as a reader. Um, I'm curious. I mean, it, it seemed to me, and I, I'm, I'm curious whether or not this, your approach to this piece was to sort of write a tantrum from the perspective of the parent after the tantrum of the child. I so that's love the first that you question. That. That's okay. Wonderful. But no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Could be that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, 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 it's uh, it's ba it basically it's I mean it's it's not a proud moment for me as a mother, but my youngest child she is she's very much an ocean in a person, and um and she feels things deeply, and one evening because she was four and she was upset so she was getting ready for bed and she closed the bathroom door and I said why are you closing the bathroom door and she switched off the light and she sunk down to the floor behind the door and started brushing her teeth and I was like what are you doing, and she said I don't want to brush my teeth and cry in the dark. Oh. No, that's good. That's great. I mean, I'm gonna wait. You hold that thought. <laughs> so I went and I ran up and I got my phone. And mother of the year, as I say, I started to note down what she was saying. And she wanted to eat pasta and she wanted to uh, something about a car and whatever, whatever. But it was just, I mean, from the depths of her little soul. Mm. Um, and I thought it would be a maybe a, a children's story to begin with. And then as I came back to it, I just thought, man, I also sometimes after a day where things have been things, want to brush my teeth and cry in the dark, you know? Sure. And then I came on to not so much, maybe you're onto something when you say, it wasn't so much a tantrum, but these are things that I want. And sure. as a sure. mother, nobody cares. That I want to, you know what I mean? No one's going to take me in their arms and be like, it's okay. You've had a, you know what I mean? No one tucks me into bed with a, with a hot drink kind of thing. So... I guess it was making that space for myself and there are a thousand different things in there and a thousand different things that I wanted, you know, when I'm craving carbs, when I'm just wanting to run away from my life because I'm overwhelmed. As someone with ADHD, I'm sure you associate with that, like you relate mm -hmm. to that, too much noise, too much going on. Um, you know, I just want to live somewhere by the sea and it was just all of those kind of things. And um, and I want I wanted it, the reason for the forward slash is I wanted it to read as pauses but also there are some ones that are frantic and feral. And then there are some ones that you, you hardly dare even say out loud, mm. you know, like there's, there's a one line, which is, you know, I, I want to hear your voice rumble against my ear. Once again, you, you don't dare tell the person that because you don't want to appear vulnerable. So that one's a, a sort of a whispered one, you know, and uh, I just want to stop forgetting to drink my coffee is an exasperated mum one, you know? So there's, there's kind of a, a bit of the difference the different ways in which you would express all of those deep felt desires and needs and wants inside of you. So that mm. was the idea for it. And I wasn't sure about putting it in, but in the end, um, two people who read it, they were like, this is fantastic. This has to yeah. be in this as well. And she's, and she's a little girl. So she has her, she has her own woman's journey to go through too. And even though she's, she was only four at the time, her desire and her frustration is just as legitimate and needed a space as well in, in the sure. book. Yeah, there, I mean, when the poem starts off, it feels like a child's voice, but very quickly it becomes sort of motherly, particularly with this, the line, I, um, I may get the wording exactly wrong, but my paraphrase would be, I want to fold you up and put you back inside me, right? Which um, I think as a, well, as a parent, I kind of get part of that, right? Like I kind of get some of that aspect, and, and maybe that might be the, you know, the feminine principle in me, um, kind of. Uh, resonating with with the idea that I look at my child and maybe in the same way that I look at some of my poems and it it's so right I love I love her so much but she's so vulnerable and I don't want her to be hurt and it's like I want to just it's like it's like a little piece of your heart walking around out there and yeah. uh, get back here you know right. you to be safe but actually, ironically, the fold, the thing I want to fold up, because that is actually a personal line, is not my child. Ah, interesting. 
Uh huh. And I will leave it at that to leave some mystery to it, but it's not my child. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That does that leads to mystery indeed. Uh, many many different readings that could come out of that. I think the other thing too that that it seemed to very much fit in the collection because the uh, the forward slashes felt like choppy waves to me. Mm, um, I, lo I do love that. I love the visual element of the forward yeah. slash. I, that is, for example, something that I learned and that I, I, I think I even took to social media about it. I was like, why do you guys do this? You know, what does it mean? And after reading what people said about it and then having great suggestions of others peop other people's work where they used it, I saw mm. how it was visual and it was for performance and it has so many functions. And I must say, I think my favorite function for it, I use it a few times in this book, is definitely the visual, the choppiness of the waves. There's a, there's a poem in the, um, in the book as well later where it's, for me, the growing of a vine. It's about mm -hmm. moss creeping and growing, and I, I sort of uh, spaced it out to look like that. Sure. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful technique. I love it. And poetry without, without um, punctuation is also really great because it just leaves a lot of room to play, you know? And poetry needs to be playful sometimes. Certainly. Yeah, I would think poetry that's, well, on the one hand, there's a sort of false dichotomy between poetry, between seriousness and playfulness. And I think that one of the things that your collection does really well is that it it treats very serious matters playfully in a way that engages the reader in them. So uh, yeah, I really, I really en enjoy the fact that you've taken playfulness on it. Yeah, and, and it, I think exactly you can you can play with the process, and it doesn't mean you're being disrespectful of the actual subject. Indeed. Can we turn our attention to regret? This is yeah. I I think it may be the shortest poem in the collection. Yeah. And possibly one of the shortest I've ever written, to be honest. Yes, regret. And again, um, you probably need to see this poem to understand it because it's or well, you can describe it in a minute. Shall I shall I read it? Yeah, please. Regret. Shark in the water. Blood on her fingers. Blood on the water. Shark. Death. On her oh. hands. And that's it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I was curious how you were going to read the poem, whether you're going to read it down. So it's, yeah, no, it's to describe it for the reader. Yeah, to describe it for the reader, it, um, where the pauses are in this piece rather than uh, slashes, there are, ta I would say, tabs, maybe two tabs between the first word or short phrase and the second. Um, and, and so there's a column. There are two columns, one, one beginning with shark and the other beginning with in the water. Um, and so it's, I was really struck by the way that I could read these in two ways. Um, I had just gone through reading, I, yeah, um, and I, I really enjoyed the sort of even more fragmented method of reading down and then down. Shark, blood on, blood on, shark on her hands, absolutely. Right. Um, I'm curious whether you had any intention in giving the reader the opportunity to have those two different sorts of readings. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's not contrapuntal in the sense that it was not intentionally let me make sense here and let me make sense there. Sure. But definitely I wanted it to be able to be read. And I want, I'm not an experimental writer. Um, I do like to experiment, but it's not, you know, my thing. I don't, but I, I do quite like for this poem, to be honest, because it is a poem that was written so personally to me. Mm. I had to dissimulate what it was about basically this is a, a very personal poem and I needed to hide in as many levels and as possible in as many mazes as possible what I did actually need to say sure. so, so that's pretty much where it came from um, and I love the, the shape of it too I love that it's there's a space between the first column and the second that's a bit sharp like sort of a jagged shark tooth um, uh -huh. And uh, and I love it as well. Personally, when I read a poem where the title and the content it are intriguing, like why does that have that title? When it, you know, why is it called I don't know, Lily of the Valley when it's talking about you know shoes kind of thing? I, I love that that sort of mystery around mm -hmm. poetry. And uh, this has actually just been accepted for publication in Street Keg Magazine, which is a, an experimental magazine in the UK. Um, yeah, so so it's 
it's a lot of things and and there's I mean in this poem there's a lot. There's regret by the name. There's also that thing as a woman, as a girl, you grow up and you don't go into the sea when you have your period because it'll attract sharks. I don't know if that's ever actually happened in the history of humanity, but it's a thing that you're told. Uh-huh. Um, shark death, the fact that sharks are killed, whatever. There's, there's a lot in there. Right. And it's for the reader to really decide what is what and who is who and who is guilty and who's regressing and what they are right. regressing. Right. One of the things that struck me is, you know, this fascination that we have with shark, I won't say we, but the fascination that many people have with Shark Week, which presents sharks as being this deadly scourge that human beings are facing that somehow threatens our very livelihood, and yet uh, humans kill way more humans than sharks really ever could, right? Absolutely. And also, may I just add, that's a very American thing. Shark Week is not a big deal in the rest of the world. Okay. <laughs> well, this is good to know. One of the One of the additionally toxic things about the United States. No, but it, it, it is a very I mean, uh, there was a, a, t- a point in time when my, my uh, National Geographic and Discovery Channel were, for some reason, American. They were no longer sort of the, the whatever, the, well, National Geographic was no longer British or whatever it was. And right. it changed from beautiful documentary about the ocean, about this, to Shark Week, Deadly Python, Deadly This, How Many Ways Can You Die in Australia? And it was like, gosh, guys, are you, are you okay in America? Are you okay? Yeah, so, so that's a very American thing. And also, Shark Week is also another way to refer to periods as well. Oh, I've never, I've never heard that before. Shark Week. Uh, that is, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, the other thing, that, so in addition to this, uh, what I would say is like a, a quote-unquote, you know, predatory animal that actually doesn't pose us as much harm as we pose it because of the immense shark hunting that we do. Um, I, I, the, the overtones of menstruation with blood in the water, I think, were fairly clear. Um, I didn't catch the shark tooth design, but the fact that the very thing that some human beings are afraid of about sharks is is then positioned as the absence of the poem, right? It's the outline of the shark tooth um, in the white space that's there. So it's yeah. yeah, I really I love that. This is very very masterful, tightly constructed, uh, really wonderful poem. Thank you. It's always nice when people appreciate it because there is obviously a lot of a lot of work and thinking put into all these little details. Well, you know, and any time that I encounter a poem that seems at first blush, you know, I, we'll use the term experimental, but it might be, you know, where it seems impenetrable or obscure, I try to give the writer the benefit of the doubt and saying, well, this is probably somehow esoteric or hermetic. There's There's something here that's that's for me to puzzle out and for me to to discover or find. Mm. And thankfully, in having a conversation with the author, I actually get <laughs> some additional layers to that. Yeah. Um, I think we've already I think we've already addressed a, a lot of the different questions that um, that I had raised uh, or that I had suggested we talk about. So I just want to move on to the poem in the section uh, Arctic, The Other yes. Woman, which was a, a poem that you referenced earlier. Yes, this is my baby, this one. This is my favorite poem I've ever written. Um, yeah, shall I read it? Yeah, please do. <clears throat> the sun has set, and at this hour, shadows hang between the daylight and the trees. And there the sudden scent of blood, scent of man, carries to me on the breeze, the wind howling through, falls silent at my feet. Good hunting, my lady. It whispers, then retreats. There is a darkness in this forest, an end that rivals death itself. In the mist about my ankles, even lizards know they would do well to hide in their hovels and underground. Dirt crunches beneath treacherous soil. Leaves plunge downwards to be eaten by the earth. The naked trees testify this forest is deadly. It will swallow you whole. I hear footsteps racing, running in thundering lockstep. Flash of black, flash of teeth. There are dangerous games afoot. Surely it's time to turn back. Surely it's time to go home. I am well beyond my borders now. She can't catch me. She can't catch me. Hear why I lurk and linger on the periphery just out of sight, just beyond her mind's eye. She knows I am there, her veins coarse with rage and vengeance, but she does not know where. She is death. She is danger. 
but the line has been crossed. The threat prowls within her marked territory. She may think, I have lost, but this no longer bears any resemblance to a fair fight. No, now two legs, not enough. I drop down onto four, draw strength from the thousand invisible heartbeats, the lifeblood, the microbiome on the forest floor. Mm. There is fear and some fury encrusted under each hungry claw. The hunt smells of my father, champion, long before I had ever heard of this sport. And I wonder, would he be proud? There is sweat at my temples, and my wrists are bound to stop them from trembling. I step crabways, low and feral, without shadow or sound. Your ears twitch, and you shudder, your neck craning to see what you and I must learn the hard way. The deadliest thing in here is me. <sighs> That's my favorite one. I, and I just noticed the way thematically that this ties in not only to, um, you know, the previous poem where we had talked about these, the theme, to be a woman and the themes of womanhood and uh, where you had mentioned this sort of, I'm not sure if the word you used was feral, though I think it comes out yes, in this I did, piece. I did use the word feral, absolutely. Yeah, but that's certainly, that, that, same, uh, that same tone comes out in this, this primal animalistic tone. But by... In terms of the the re regret, the, the piece that we had just talked about, I think this question of who the predator and who the prey is, or who the hunted and who the hunter is, likewise, who the she, who the you, who the her, mm -hmm. and who who the the man is, who whose scent is detected, right? Like, how do we? I don't even want to say triangulate, but quadrangulate these four terms that are brought into uh, brought into here. And then, in addition, the father. So maybe quintagulate. I don't know. Uh, the, <laughs> That's the, 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 yeah, the, I mean, the question of identity uh, in this piece really um, strikes me as quite interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this poem came to be? Yes, of course. I'd love to. I don't get asked much about this poem. I love it, though. So, And also the title, The Other Woman, which is very provocative in this right. poem. Everybody assumes straight away The Other Woman. It must be about an affair. It must be about, you know, something like that, which is fine. You, people must, must think what they want to think about it. Um, first of all, this poem was written... Um, as as an act for me of of finding power in something again mm -hmm. in a situation which was out of my hands that's where the 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 aggression and the predatory side of it basically from being hunted you are not going to hunt me anymore basically that kind of feeling of I'm not going to be a victim or a prey so that is where the the aggression of this poem comes from mm -hmm. it was in fact two lines that came to me to begin with, flash of black, flash of teeth, and what you and I must ha learn the hard way, the deadliest thing in here is me, are based on two things. First of all, I have this forest in my house where I go walking and I process things and I write in my, you know, voice notes and whatever, and, uh, and it's a dense, dense forest, and one day I was walking when it wasn't quite nightfall, but literally a black dog ran through the forest and it was a bliss, and it made me jump because I think I had a, a near phone in, I was listening to music, and it was just fairly, already as a woman, you're never 100% secure when you're alone. Um, and it was just that flash of black, flash of teeth. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, goodness. And that just appeared to me. And then the last line, which is my favorite, the deadliest thing in here is me, is from the, I believe it is Neil, Neil Gaiman who wrote, I'm not a huge Neil Gaiman fan, fan, but I don't read a lot of fantasy, but who wrote in one of his books that, I think, was it a witch or maybe just a woman? I think probably a witch needs to know that 100% that she is the most terrifying thing in the forest. Mm. And and I loved that the power that is given in that, you know, and, and how would it be to know that the deadliest thing in this space is me and nothing can touch me? Sure. Um, so it was kind of built up from reversing that victim, reversing that being prey, reversing that... Um, yeah, that, that victim, that vulnerability into something where at the beginning, let's say the speaker is vulnerable and I'm scared and this forest is dark, but actually at the end of it all, she's the threat. She's right. talking, she's speaking a warning to whoever it is. I'm not going to go into the details of who is who and what is what. Um, but I do love that you picked up on all five characters because not everyone did. So, so yeah, so it comes from there. And I'm a big, I mean, I, I just said I don't read fantasy, but I'm a big fan of Angela Carter who mm. took the fairy tales and made them a little bit more uh, elaborate, embroidered, sometimes a bit darker, oftentimes a bit darker. And so for me, it was like that sort of creating that Angela Carter-esque universe in which the, 
the the um, the prey becomes the predator. And in fact, now that I'm saying it, it's a lot like what is it in the Company of Wolves, where at the end mm -hmm. the Red Riding Hood laughs at the wolf and she and she strips down in front of him and she says, you you know, you are no threat to me, basically. So, so that's where it came from. Um, it's also scored by, the, the rest of it came together because I was listening to Ludovico Rinaldi's Eros, which is this beautiful piece of music, very intense. It stresses out my husband a lot because it just builds and builds intention and intention. Um, and it was listening to that, in fact, that the rest of the verses came to me. So there's a lot of different things that fed into this poem, and I think that's probably why I love it so much, because it was sort of really a lot of rivers that made this particular ocean of a poem, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm glad that you brought up the rivers that make up the ocean and the tributaries because I think that's going to come back later in our discussion. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if we can move on to the immediately next the, the poem that immediately follows yeah. this, the uh, the cancer. Yes, absolutely. So, oh, this is another forward slash poem. There you go. Right. This is a poem that was actually written in a uh, workshop on cartography where we were shown different maps as gener generative prompts for writing, and I wrote this on that. So here we go. The Cancer. The earth was held between two breasts, warm and safe from the beasts inside. The world was kept against her chest, milk from one, salt water from the other. The world was split along her middle, one half wrenched like a joint from a socket, like a feeding calf from its mother. The other severed long, painful strokes, and she cried out this bleeding earth. With every motion, the fault lines cracked. The ocean stood to attention, bursting their banks, covered the earth, only volcanoes left standing, spitting fire and ash from their gaping mouths. There was no alternative. It had to be done. Letting the blood deep from the earth's core, and after the rubble, after the rains, after much digging beneath each breast that cradled the earth, lay the cancer they had buried there long before. Mm. I just want to say this, I mean, the way, my interpretation anyway, um, that, this, that this piece uses mastectomy as a metaphor or within a mythology and situates, uh, right, this, the, it situates breast cancer as a creation story, right? Which, at least in my mind, which I think is just a masterful kind of uh, take on the on on the theme of nature that you've got throughout the book, and ties it really wonderfully into into womanhood in terms of a, yet another one of the threats that it would seem our disregard for the natural world winds up placing uh, as a burden on women, mm -hmm. <laughs> yet again, right? Another another threat to be vigilant against. Mm. Well, that's exactly right. It was it was actually following two friends of mine who had breast cancer and had mastectomy. So, I mean, I could have made it about ovarian cancer, but it's less visual. Um, mm. But it was it was very much that. And in fact, it, it was very simple. The 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 image that was in, was the prompt for this was one of those um, sort of you know from the colonial time maps where there was just two circles. Mm -hmm. And it was, on, it was an online workshop, so she just put this on the screen. And the first thing I thought of was breasts because it looked like breasts. And uh, and and then as I was writing, the, these people came, these friends of mine came to, to mind and the suffering that was there. And then it got worked into um, into the earth, into the mm. and that the irony of the fact that you can remove and remove and remove. I mean, cancer is such a such a devilish disease, and it's still yeah. there. You know? Insidious. And it's or a worse cancer is there, or you know the one cancer was covering the other one, or so that's that's sort of where that that came from, and, and that that frustration that I mean it can be also you can extrapolate it to also sort of relate to all of us in that while there are multi million multilateral companies polluting the earth, we have to use you know we have to um, sort out our our rubbish and use tote bags instead of plastic, whatever, whatever, but how much difference are we making when they are actually literally, you know what I mean? There's that right. kind of feeling of what is the point of all of our little efforts when the world is dying because of these giant corporations and sure. huge things happening. So there's also that frustrating, uh, frustration of no matter how hard we work, it's still there. You know, it's still going in the same direction. 
Right, especially uh, I'm thinking particularly of Naomi Klein's book where um, I've, I'm blanking on the title of it, but um, yeah, the one somebody, on the shock doctrine. Yeah, right, the one that came out immediately after the shock doctrine, and um, I mean the book basically shows that it's the supply chain that is really the issue, right? Like, so you you've on the one hand, it's the responsibility of uh, the corporations to change their supply chain in order to limit the uh, carbon emitting fuels that that are being used to transport goods. But on the other hand, uh, you know, all consumers can really do is try to buy and shop local and keep exactly. the, when the, consumers, when the consumers are trying to feed their kids and balance the right. checkbook. I mean, come on now, you know, right. I never, and there's such a pressure and whatever on, on the individual mm -hmm. when we are, most of us are doing our best, you know, and, and, and yet, it's not going to be enough. You know especially, I mean? that, that especially when so much of the domestic uh, household economy work is handled uh, unpaid in most cases throughout the world by women, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's such wonderful, such wonderful social, political commentary uh, I, that isn't over, I mean, it's not over the top. It's not, you know, you're not bonking the reader over the head no, with any of this. You don't want to preach. It is an art. You want people to enjoy it. You know what I mean? Right. I'm not I'm not Naomi Klein writing a book about educating right. people. That's right. my purpose. And it's a difficult thing because you don't want to be like, women have it so hard all the time and the planet is dying. Yeah. You know what I mean? There sure. also be the art form there and the enjoyment and the beauty of the words, which sure. will stay with you for longer, hopefully, and maybe will right. make the message not more palatable, but more memorable. Sure, certainly. Well, and the, I, I think there's there's an idea, at least, that even if a reader comes to these poems and doesn't see the these sort of subdued messages, uh, what I might call like the esoteric element that's mm -hmm. that's within them, that there's a kind of osmosis, right? That that there will be yeah. traces of that idea that wind up filtering in, even if it's uh, at the subconscious or unconscious level. Uh, let's let's move on to the last section of the book, uh, Indian for the Indian Ocean. Um, I, I'd like to go first with In Summer I Am Beautiful, and then I'd like to close out with uh, Who Will Hold the Ocean. But let's take a pause between there because I want to really kind of dive in and discuss each of them. Yes. Okay. So just a little a little extra about the the chapters. I am from Mauritius, which is in the Indian Ocean. So the poems in the Indian Ocean section all mm. very personal. Um, uh, and the first, of the first poem in that section is In Summer I Am Beautiful. <clears throat> in summer I am beautiful, not like in winter, when even the sun hides its face from me, as if the thought of spending the long, languid dwindling of day in my company were too much to bear. Winter, where shadows creep and creep when trees are naked, when hope decides to hibernate. In winter, a grayness covers the earth. There's no telling the color of a dandelion or the green breadth of a blade of grass. Like a faithful mouse, I have learned to hoard small crumbs of happiness, the familiar creak in the floorboard, the last drop of tea in the cup for safekeeping, the steam-coaxed softness of skin. Not so in summer. In summer, I wear beauty like a shroud, and my solitude becomes a wildflower crown. In summer, I gather beauty all about me, wet at my temples, between my breasts, at the backs of my knees. Like calls to like. Salt calls to salt. There, submerged in the forgiving ocean, I find in water and in summer, I am beautiful. Yeah. Uh, structurally, formally, one of the things that struck me about this is the way that you, that mostly a poem, but which a prose poem, which also contains line breaks in it. And I'm I'm kind of curious how, and contains these the the slashes, uh, mm -hmm. some sentences so short that it seems like it might be a line break, even though it fits the dimensions of prose. I'm curious how it was that you. Uh, decided on this form for this piece, um, and what in what you tend to think that the form might have as a an impact on or effect on the reader and their interpretation of it. 
Um, that is a very good question, but I'm afraid I'm going to be obtuse and say it's like cooking. Sure. <laughs> it comes together and it, it just fits the way it does. This actually, the second um, verse or paragraph did not exist mm. until much after. In fact, I think I had already sent my manuscript off to the editor mm. um, when it was just missing something about winter. It was just too much about summer. Um, I wrote this almost as if it were a diary entry, as if it were a journal, as if it were just me journaling about the fact that now that I live in Europe, I'm sure I have seasonal affective disorder where half the year I'm miserable um, mm. because I miss the sun, you know, and, and I guess that's where I wanted it. That's how it came out of me, that sort of, just a little perspective of, of myself telling myself what was going on. Sure. And why it was that that in summer things are alive and in summer things come back to life. Also, when we talk about seasons, we also talk about season of life. We also talk about all of those things sort of that come with it, especially as women, because we, you know, we're children, then we have puberty, then we have whatever, then we have menopause. I mean, we are constantly changing. I've mm. been reading up about just even how women's um, hormones change on a 28-day cycle, whereas mm. men's is constant, repeated in, at night and then fills up, and then in the morning you're raring to go. And and even that, there's sort of the, the seasonality of that as well. <clears throat> that affects everything, our decision-making, our energy, our mood, absolutely everything. So there's a lot of different sort of elements to that. And I think it was just natural to write it out in that way as a, <clears throat> almost like a journal entry. Mm. And the, um, the forward slashes between the three things for me are the movements of the hands, which in fact I think I did when I was performing it, wetted my temples between mm. my breasts backs of my knees it's literally just duck 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 showing the showing sure. the, the motion like calls to like is biblical and uh, and salt calls to salt so that's why those those shorter lines are there um but yes as for as generally speaking it's just because it came out that way and it was edited that way and then it, it felt like it was just the right amount of spicy and salty and savory and sure. you know, just the right balance of flavors I yeah I love the I love the casual tone uh, that it that it evokes and I'm also sort of I mean on the one hand there's a sense that like um, when the sun is shining when the when it is warmer out that um, I am beautiful but I think on the other hand it's like that's the time at which I notice my beauty because I'm not so focused on the cold and on survival and on Right. Or covered in seventeen layers of clothing, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, having to having to cover up my beauty, which I think also again sort of speaks to some of the ways in which uh, women need to or can choose to be vigilant in the society that they're in by by covering up from the male gaze. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, I think like the the male gaze is like old man winter. Absolutely. But you know what I love about this conversation, Nick, is that you're really picking up on the side that I don't have because I'm not a dude. You're really picking up on the, on the, mm. on the, you're in fact giving me a lot of the perspective of from the other side. And it's true. Absolutely. Old man winter completely. But it's sure. something that I don't like and I have to hide from and I have, and I have to survive. It's always sure. there and I have to survive. Absolutely. Sure. Well, and that, that I think in turn also speaks to the, the climate crisis that we're facing right now. And that, you know, like, we're we're all now threatened by this by the gaze of global warming, right? Uh, by by overall heat heat death in the earth, right? This is the thing that is glaring down on us, uh, and so the question is like, how are we gonna how are we gonna face this? How how do we have to be vigilant against this? What what actions are we now going to have to take, right? What is what is the ecological equivalent to only being able to wear one earbud because I need to be able to hear whether someone's coming up behind me? Yes, exactly. Uh, and I mean, for me, I think this this piece and this conversation uh, tend to help me see uh, the internalized misogyny that that I've got to work through, right? That's that's kind of the the ignorance is that on a daily basis I'm not really uh, conscious yeah. of, right? Of course, of course. Well, that's wonderful. Oh, I'm very glad. I'm very glad, Nick. You're like the ideal reader. <laughs> Uh, I, well, let's hope that there are more ideal readers out there, and perhaps even more ideal than I am. Because uh, I mean, I'll say, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't have, given my own schedule, you know, parenting and therapy and writing and everything, um, it, it was not easy to carve out time. And I don't, I felt bad that I wasn't able to give 
uh, the book greater attention. Though I think for anybody listening, I would also say pay attention to the to my social media feeds because I will be writing a more detailed analysis of at least one of these pieces, uh, if not including a, a review of the collection that sort of summarizes my thoughts. So Thank hopefully you. that'll help future readers. So let's let's close out with uh, who will hold the ocean because I think yeah. you, you mentioned this piece before as well, and I think it's a in my estimation, a pretty good um, conclusion to bring together both of these, or well, all three of these themes of uh, femininity and motherhood and um, nature, the climate crisis. Yeah. Okay, who will hold the ocean? Who will comfort her in her rage? Whose arms could wrap across the earth? Whose legs wouldn't buckle under her constant motion? Who could see past her belly swollen with oil? and regret. The great sutures that hold her together in her depths, who will breathe life into her wearied sinews, shore up the arms that hold the continents apart? Who will tell her she is condemned to hunger, of the slander spoken by rivers and streams? Who will thank her for her giving, her constant giving? Who will teach her that the darkest parts of her body are where the creatures are the most boneless and bright? Who will dismantle the great iron skeletons of conquest that lie rotting, eating away at her throat and her back teeth? Who will whisper eulogies to her salt and to her sand? Who will defy the moon and the white tyranny he holds over her? Who will hold up her glaciers, black fractal by fractal, until she is spent? Who will comfort the ocean? Who will hold her ends in place? The the concluding line here, I mean, you have these masterful conclusions because uh, it leaves me with this question of, right, the, what to go back and reread the poem considering what the boundaries of the ocean are, but also what the purposes of the ocean are, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of ends in both of those, in both of those senses. Um, and there's, there's a certain, right, the poem has this explicit sense of, uh, or question to responsibility, right? There's a, there's an accountability that is brought up uh, in which the reader is then implicated. Uh, how did how did this piece come out? Like, what what's the story behind how you developed this? The story behind this one is is not a very glamorous one. Um, it was it was again as I said before the Indian section of this Indian Ocean section is a personal one, and this was basically at a point in my life I think a biographical poem. Um, there was a point where in my personal life, my professional life, my life in general, there was just a lot and too much and and too much for too long. And at one point I just thought, well, who... A, a bit like when I, what I was saying during my, you know, tantrum poem, mm. who will comfort me? Right. Who will put me? You know, I have one of my, one of my collections is about parentified childhood, which has been my own experience. So there's a lot of that, you know, that old, that we only realize when we have children, all of the issues that we have. Um, and so I think that's where, that's the point from which it came. Um, and there's specific lines that relate to that, you know. There's a, there's a line in there, for example, about I had a very, a very um, traumatic and dangerous childbirth in which I almost died. And there's a few lines oh. about that in there, um, which are very just, Obviously, you know, the metaphor is very obvious. Mm. But then it developed further beyond that to so many women that I know, um, so many, especially, especially mom, mothers, especially creative mothers, mothers who are juggling maybe a part-time work and creative projects, writing or whatever, plus mm. the kids, young children, plus whatever, maybe they're single parents, maybe they're solo parents all of the time. Whatever it was, there were a lot of women that I knew and that I loved and that I cared for who were in the same sort of situation of... Who will love us? Right. There's a poem in this collection about that saying, I'm tired, and it finishes with, I'm tired, but no one puts me gently to bed. And it is that 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 feeling and that not just a desire, that need, that longing to d- be loved and to be taken care of and to be told that you are safe and, you know, you can rest and you can lean on something that is bigger than you. And then when I, when I, um, when I think... This was sort of a half-written poem when in Mauritius, 
there was no, it was actually after, it was after the oil spill that I read this poem. There was a massive oil spill off the coast of Mauritius that like devastated our west coast. We're a tiny island, we rely on tourism, and it was just devastating for Mauritius. Um, and so that was where the idea of this oil that no matter what the ocean does, she cannot get rid of it. It's on her surface. She needs people to help her, the same people who put it there. Um, and and the the um, when you read about you know that it's a horrible thing to think about but that island of trash that lives in the ocean mm-hmm. and the same thing she can't get rid of it her animals cannot get rid of it there's nothing she can do she's right. stuck with it, and yet she keeps going and she keeps giving to us and keeps the moon in check and keeps you know the tides and keeps she's doing her best even though she's polluted even though she's abused even though she's fed with things that poison her. Um, but she keeps going, and so this was really just not even a cry to arms. It was a it's a lament of yeah. can someone yeah. please give us and the planet a break? You know that was that's really what it is. So it's not a particularly deep and glamorous metaphor in that sense, um, but but it's a poignant one, and I think that it's something that that definitely many women. Um, or, or people who care, people who have a lot of caring responsibilities and a lot of, you know, things on their plate will relate to. Uh, I mean, I, I think that not only does the piece really fuse the personal and the social, you know, the more general human feminine experience, to my mind, it by doing that, it also sort of evoked for me this sense of the the insufficiency or incapacity of of any individual person to really uh, properly worship the divine feminine or properly worship like the feminine principle and also the way in which we as individuals sort of lean on mother nature, right, in order to take comfort ourselves without, as you pointed out, without giving that support and that care back. Um, So, again, another... Yet one more poem in this uh, excellent collection that uh, that really fuses all of these uh, all of these themes on all of these different levels and dimensions together. I'm I'm kind of curious if if you might uh, be willing to talk a bit about uh, how it is that your uh, background as a British Mauritian influences your the I mean obviously there's you know you talked about the more personal elements of this particular section, but I'm I'm kind of interested in the way that it influences your approach to language, your engagement with a global poetry audience. Uh, uh, how does that How does that background of yours influence? Because it's a very foreign experience for me, uh, and so I'm I'm very interested to know how it is that you bring your lived experience in Mauritius to to the writing that you do. Well, it's actually an interesting thing because one of my collections is about Mauritius. And um, the it's actually one of the hardest things I've ever written, writing about Mauritius. Um, but my experience as a British Mauritian, I've lived in a diaspora most of my life. Um, and it, it's an interesting thing because it must be said that in the literary community, You've got your American poets who have your American way of seeing things and your American, you know, whatever. And then you've got the English poets and they've got their particular clan. Then you've got the English working class poets or the English experimental poets or, you know, whatever it is. And everyone kind of has a thing. And I don't really fit into anything. <laughs> but that's my experience in life as well. So it should be no difference. So so um, how it influences my writing is, first of all, I think that there is there is there are many things that I write about where someone will take a part of it and they will relate to it. So, for example, a poem like this, a woman, a working mother, an exhausted person, will take that bit, you know. Um, A neurodivergent person might take what they need. A woman of color might take what they need. But it is very rare, in fact, so rare that it's never happened yet that I have found my niche. Mm. Um, I have had to adapt to so many other niches. And then there are niches that just don't understand me. For example, I had a very, a very, not very pleasant experience when I first started submitting my poetry. I had a poem that was multilingual, bilingual. It had Creole, Mauritian Creole in it, and it was about slavery and about, inter- well, not slavery, but uh, it mentioned slavery and about internalized um, racism in Mauritius. 
and uh, with some terms and a footnote explaining the terms. And I sent it, in fact, to Amer an American magazine. And this is something that I would say America needs to do a little bit better, especially in, the, well, in every area, but especially in this thing where I got a reply back from the editor who said, you know, we're not taking this poem and you need to be careful when talking about slavery. And I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically, their take was, I had no position to talk about slavery because the only slavery that had happened was the, what they knew of, uh, I mean, understandably, American slavery, which was terrible and whatever, and understand that. But that's not my experience. I'm not going to be writing about the black struggle in America as a Mauritian person. I'm not going to take up that space. But you see what I mean. There was this complete mm -hmm. closure from that particular editor to the fact that any other kind of suffering anywhere else in the world could have happened. Sure. Um, and uh, that was just one particular editor. It's not happened again. But for me, it was very telling of, okay, well, maybe there will actually be people in this world who will not be able to understand or organize where I'm coming from into their heads. Um, and to begin with, it was quite a daunting thought. Mm. My multilingual writing, who's mm. going to read it? Um, does anyone care? You know, especially, I mean, at least English and Spanish, there are many speakers who are bilingual, but English and Creole, who speaks English and Creole, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but then there comes a point where you also have to say, whether or not anybody likes it, this is what I'm offering, and this is what I'm writing. Mm. And if anything, it is some, something of a political statement even to say, this is my identity, and this is who I am, and this is where I come from, and, uh, and to respect the reader to be able to do the work. They don't need to be spoon-fed. You know, you don't need, I'm not saying that people now need to become fluent in the language I'm writing in, but it can be very patronizing to be like, oh, but my poor reader is not going to understand this term. And, you know, no, let them do the work. Let them learn about this amazing place. Like you just said, it's so foreign for me. Let them learn about this foreign place and this foreign concept and this different way of doing things. That's how we learn. That's how I learn. I, I haven't grown yeah. up in the UK in many areas. I haven't grown up in the Middle East, but I've been published there. I haven't grown up in Australia, but I've learned about it. In America, but I've learned about it. You know what I mean? There's, there's, yeah. Yeah. It, rather than seeing it as a limitation and something that can be um, a préjugé that can be that's not in your favor, you can see it as an amazing opportunity on the contrary to broaden your and other people's horizons. Yeah. So that has pretty much been my... I'm not sure if that was answered your question, but that has pretty much been my my approach to, to what I'm doing. So there's no niche for me. I will make the niche myself. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it certainly does answer the question. I think, I think, sorry, I'm getting an echo, so it's throwing me off a little bit. Uh, it, it definitely answers my question, and I think it speaks to the way that you, your, your vision or your engagement in what is, I would say, this sort of siloed creative writing space that exists, right? There's, unfortunately, uh, the responsibility for decolonizing it has been taken up by the folks who are not part of the extant silos, right? And I think, hopefully, anybody listening to this podcast who's part of it, and myself included, right, will try to do the work of starting to decolonize ourselves because it really shouldn't be the responsibility of the more marginalized people to do the extra heavy lifting, right? Um, Speaking of heavy lifting, um, but not necessarily colonization other than that that Instagram and Meta more broadly imposes on us. I was wondering what you were going to segue to there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess speaking of colonization, uh, yes. how have you engaged on social media in order to generate the kind of engagement and reach that you have? What, oh, what has been your approach? I've engaged you? aggressively. <laughs> I've come out guns blazing because basically... I think I was so happy to find other creatives, which I don't have. I live in France already. People who write in English, there's not many of them. In my immediate circle of sort of friends and family, people I'm with, there's not that many creatives um, or people who, you know, pursue it. There's readers and stuff, but not so much. So I don't actually have that many real life tangible people. So to find my imaginary friends online, I was so happy to find them that straight away I just come up with guns blazing for my work and their work. Um, I, will, I ran, in fact, a, an interview series for two years on my blog um, promoting, promoting other people because, you know, even if it's one Google hit or one more web, website hit, then that's helpful for them to sell their book. Um, and, because they're so, and because I'm so sick of 
poetry competitions where it's the same five people who are married to the same five people who have been to the same five schools who are winning, you know, because they have the money to enter, because they have disposable en income to enter multiple poems into this award. So they win the award, and from winning the award, they then get the poetry contact, then they get... I mean, what is that? Right. You know, when the, and, and, and that's what turns people away from poetry, because... Um, if again, excuse me, I'll take the example of, of an American poet who was an award-winning poet who I read and I liked one of their poems and so I looked them up and I read more and it's like, oh, I'm sitting in my garden and I'm looking at the birds and now I'm sitting in my garden at my country house and I'm looking at the birds. Who lived that life? Like, what? Right. You know? How is that relatable to anybody kind of thing? And why is that getting a platform and the money when I'd rather read about the struggles of every woman and I'd rather read about the neurodivergent people or the people who are experiencing changes in their body and, and are okay with it and something that tells me that even though you go through something traumatic, you'll be all right or something that makes fun of things to make life lighter because life is hard. There's so many voices out there that need a platform and that don't have it and it is criminal. And unfortunately, I don't have billions of money to invest in them, but I do have my little platforms and my little things, my social media, my blog, my newsletter, mm -hmm. um, my presence now that COVID's over and we can go and, you know, see each other and, and do things in person. And I will use that, you know, um, because, I mean, I think it's just a decent human being. Do. do I want poetry places to exist? Do I want poetry books to be made? Do I want to read them? Yes. So, of course, I'm going to support them. And uh, and generally, I actually get this question quite a bit about people are like, well, how do you get people to want to help you and how do you get engagement or whatever? And I must say, it surprises me, but generally, it's just be really nice. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not rocket science to, <laughs> to reach out and be like, oh, you've got a book out? That's so cool. Congratulations. What does that cost you to type on social media? Right. You know? What does it cost you to be like, oh, I'm sorry, you're having a bad day, sending you love, or, man, this is hilarious, or I love that artwork, or just tell people what you think. But I think that we are so, maybe we're so into ourselves, maybe that's why. I'll give you a very practical example that, in fact, I'm going to use on, I'm going to actually run a workshop at some point about getting things done kind of thing yeah. online. And one of the things that I do in the morning, I check my social media three times a day, morning, midday-ish, and then in the evening. Uh, a bit more now because I'm promoting my book, but usually it's not more than that. And um, one of the things I do is on my feed on Twitter, for example, although must be said, since Musk took over Twitter, it is a whole hole, it used to be a lot better, is I go down my feed of the people I'm following who are saying, you know, whatever they're saying about their writing, about their podcast, about their day, about their headache, about their kids, and mm. I reply to everyone. I reply to the first 10, 15 people whether it's an actual constructed response or whether it's just, you know, I'm glad you're having a good day or this looks great or that's so cool. Or, mm -hmm. And it's genuine. It's not fake. It's not spam. It's genuinely because people deserve your attention, whether it's a second or five minutes or an hour of it. And it makes people feel important and validated. And uh, the key thing about social media is it is social. So you need social skills. And that, I think, is the bit that's missing. Um, mm in most social media, because it is, let's face it, the biggest platform for us to market our work. Um, and so that's what I do, basically, Nick. It's just be genuinely nice and enthusiastic and always have something good to say. And there's loads of, excuse the term, but lots of bollocks online, and there's lots of things that I see that I don't agree with or that I think are, you know, fairly disturbed even or whatever. But then just don't say anything. Don't, you, you don't need to know. You don't need to express it. Just keep it yourself. If you can't say something nice, just don't say anything at all. So oh, no. basically that's it. I'm I'm okay. always surprised that it doesn't occur. Ooh, are you still well, there? Yeah, i I hear you. I just cannot see you right now. I don't know what happened. Can you hear me? I well, lost there you. you. I see you. Now I don't see you. Now I see you, and I think I hear you. There you are. There you are. So, so anyway, I was just saying, be nice. Treat people how you'd want to be treated. I wouldn't want people, right now I have my book out. I'm very busy promoting my book. I hope it's not driving anyone too crazy. But I would love people, people to retreat, to save, to share, to comment, to bookmark, because that gets me more visibility to other readers who don't know my work. Because I would like people to do that to me, 
then logic would have it that I should do that to other people. I mean, it, it's not rocket science. Right. Basically. Um, it comes down to that, basically. It's so refreshing to hear somebody say that because the the whole impetus for you know my sort of starting this channel was you know to put out into the world exactly what I wanted and that was right to have a greater diversity of voices that were being heard that weren't just the academic press published you know literary standard literary magazine voices uh, and I think there's more and more of that of uh, writers supporting other writers that that is happening. On the note of treat other people the way you'd like to be treated and be nice, I think that's a fantastic way for us to end the episode. Uh, Elizabeth, I want to I want to thank you for taking the time and the energy and really giving us uh, what felt like a very engaging discussion about your whole process. So thank you for your transparency. Thank you for your vulnerability, not only in the book but in this conversation. Thank you, Nick. It's been such a pleasure. You've asked me such great questions, and you've got me thinking about my work in ways I, how I didn't before, sir. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so well, much. Well, wonderful. Then, then mission accomplished. Uh, and readers, or listeners, rather, viewers, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Paper Knives Poetry Interview Podcast. Uh, check out the website, www.paperknives.art, which has a link that gets you to the web, the YouTube page that requires a login. So, I need to fix that. Thank you, Elizabeth, for bringing it to my attention. Uh, oh, last question uh, that I need to ask in this episode. How can our audience get a copy of your book? Where can they find you? How can they follow you? How can of they course. otherwise support now, you? Now, after all of that, they're dying to read the book themselves, I hope. Um, so right now it's open for pre-orders, but you can, get, um, you can get a copy of my book, Not Quite an Ocean, from my website for signed copies. My website also for Amazon if you're in the US, for example, or straight from my publisher, ninepenspress.co.uk. Um, it's £7.50, which is like, I don't know, $9, $8, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also get, as I said, signed copies from my website. If you follow me on social media, I'm at EMC Writes Poetry on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. So uh, if you want to connect there, there are links for everything I do, including workshops and things to come in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's been an absolute pleasure having this conversation. Uh, Thank you for having me. Me too. I've loved it.